Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your interest, and welcome to my session. So my name's Chen, and I'm software engineer from Coinbase. Today, I'm going to talk about Soon, a streaming ingestion framework for near real-time data, and how we build it and optimize it at Coinbase. Okay, all right, here's the agenda for today's topic. So we'll have five sessions to talk about. We'll first see what problems are we trying to solve with Zoom, and then we'll take a look at the Zoom ecosystem and learn some basic concepts in Zoom. After that, we'll do a deep dive into the optimizations we have implemented in Zoom. And after that, lastly, we'll talk about the incremental load from the Zoom tables on Data Lake to other data systems, especially Snowflake. Okay, first, the problems we're trying to solve. The first problem is um, high table replication latency from the upstream databases to the downstream data warehouse or data lake. Well, why is the data with low latency important? Because we need such data to do a lot of things, like ad hoc incident analysis to support customers in real time. And we have dashboards or products that require near real time metrics. And we need such data to do production monitoring, anomaly detection, et cetera. Well, in order to support those use cases, we need fast data. Ideally, not only fast, but also fast data with high data quality. And in addition, we want to persist this kind of fast data in the data warehouse or data lake such that they can be easily accessed by anyone who knows how to write SQL. So, but when we try to analyze our table in our data warehouse at Coinbase, that we realize a lot of those tables with high data quality are actually building full on a daily basis, like full down for daily snapshot, as you call it. We do have incrementally built pipelines that runs um, a couple of hours, but those tables may have small data quality issues. There are some scenarios where our existing incremental pipelines cannot handle, such as uh, hard deletes. So we have to do the resync between the incrementally built tables with the full dump tables every few days or weeks. Well, you may see that uh, we have the table data with uh, no quality issue. They are up to date in the OLTP stores like Mongo or Postgres or Dynamo. However, those databases are not designed for analytics. And uh, a lot of what makes this situation even more complicated is um, we have those data scattered around in many different places. And a lot of times, we need to bring all those data into a centralized location so that we can do joins and aggregations in order to derive those meaningful insights. OK, so the problem is, how can we build a framework that can quickly replicate the tables from different places, like from any, ta any kinds of tables of any size, to this centralized location as fast as we can, and ideally in near real time? And in the meanwhile, we want to keep a high data quality so that we don't need to do this kind of resync every few days or weeks. OK, that's the first problem. The second problem is, um, as a company grows to hundreds or thousands of engineers, we start to introduce different kind of databases into our system. Well, traditionally, what this means to the data ingestion team or ETL infra team People need to come up with different designs in order to uh, replicate or ingesting those data from these di different places or Kafka. And the, the team can easily end up with multiple code bases to maintain. And the code base, uh, the code can be implemented by different people. And they can even be implemented by, uh, in different programming languages. So over time, this become a high operational overhead for the team. And for new members who want to join the team, it causes a long learning curve for them. All right, from the user perspective, it also creates an inconsistent user experience because they are provided with uh, uh, different wikis or onboarding guides to read. And they are exposed with different confusion DSLs in order to onboard their tables to the data warehouse. So this is a bad experience for both the user and the team. So, okay. Where, do I, where should I point to? OK, so how do we solve this problem um, at Coinbase? Here we introduce Zoom, a unified configuration-driven streaming ingestion framework from Kafka to Delta Lake, implemented using Spark Structure Streaming API. So basically, 
all table replication problem have also be converted to this uh, Kafka to Delta Lake ingestion problem in order to fit into this Zoom framework. Okay, so with Zoom, we basically unify the table replication and the Kafka ingestion in one problem. So for the table replication, this is designed based on the CDC events, where the change data capture events are emitted by the Kafka source connectors. And for the Kafka ingestion, it's designed based on the normal non-CDC events, where Zoom knows how to do the append-only operations to read the data from Kafka and then create data frames out of your micro batches and append those data to your S3 location for your data table. So Zoom is one generic framework for all scenarios. So it basically supports both append-only and merge updates for merge CDC, uh, for CDC and non-CDC scenario events. And it is one unified, on, it creates one unified onboarding experience for the users. And it is one framework to develop and maintain for the team. So with all those, with all those benefits, let's take a look at uh, the Zoom ecosystem from the high level. Okay, so we have the Zoom pipeline running in Spark in the middle. As we know, it reads from Kafka and writes the data to Delta Lake in two ways. One is append only, the other is merge. The events in Kafka can be the non-CDC events, which are sent out by the front-end or back-end services. They can also be CDC events, which are sent out by the Kafka source connectors running the Kafka Connect clusters. These source connector, connectors connect to different kind of databases, extract the CDC data out, and then send them into Kafka as CDC events. And soon will be responsible for continuously uh, reading those CDC events as micro batches and apply those micro batches to the underlying Delta table to keep the table up to date with the changes. All right, in order to onboard the table to Zoom, we currently still rely on Snowflake because Snowflake is still our main data warehouse solution at Coinbase. We need to do a one-time copy from Snowflake to, uh, to Databricks or, or to, to Delta Lake in order to do the bootstrap. So the tables in Snowflake are currently built using the existing way, way where the EKL runs in Airflow or EMR and the, where the, we, we export the data to, from those databases to S3 and then we load from S3 to Snowflake. So for, so for small tables, we have an alternative way to do the bootstrap. You can directly bootstrap from the Kafka source connectors directly. So a lot of Kafka source connectors have the feature to let you dump the table to uh, Kafka uh, directly. But this is not recommended for large tables because they can take a very long time and it just creates unnecessary pressure for your, uh, for your Kafka cluster. So in the future, we want to get rid of Snowflake such that we can export the data directly from those databases to some S3 location and soon can read from that S3 location to do the bootstrap. All right, given that we still use Snowflake as our main data warehouse solution, we need a way to copy those tables that we ingest into Delta Lake to Snowflake incrementally, so such that our existing pipelines in Snowflake uh, continues to run. To do that, we have implemented a table replication service based on something called CDF, change data feed, uh, a feature in Delta Lake, such that it can do this kind of incremental uh, sync between these two systems. I have a dedicated session for this, so I'll cover more about this later in detail. And in the future, we also want to explore more opportunities with this CDF data to explore op uh, options to do like uh, reverse ETL from Delta Lake to other data systems so that they can serve different kind of uh, business traffic or query patterns. All right, that's all for the data flows. Next, let's take a look at the um, user flow or operation flow what the user needs to do in order to uh, use this Zoom framework. Okay, so first, user needs to create a Kafka topic. And then for the table replication use case, they need to onboard the Kafka source connectors through a uh, Kafka orchestration service, which we build internally. And then so also, uh, user also needs to uh, implement a Zoom specification file and then deploy the changes. After that, they're gonna need to trigger this job through some jobs uh, proxy service. And, after, and last, if they want the table to be available in Snowflake, they also need to onboard it to the table replication service. So that's what the user needs to do. 
Next, the monitoring flow. So as a Zoom pipeline runs, it will emit different kind of metadata or job state or watermark to, uh, to the external metadata service. And based on the metadata in the met external metadata service, this quarter we are building something called a Zoom as a service user portal so that users can do all the operations I mentioned previously in just one place. And in addition, people can do monitoring, uh, build alerts, and, uh, and the trigger or cancel the job directly in that uh, user portal. The goal is to uh, simplify the operations from the user side so that it just makes this Zoom framework more user friendly. Okay, we also emit metrics to Datadoc. And last but not least, we have uh, also scheduled the auxiliary pipelines that automatically, automatically onboard the Zoom tables to do the optimize or Z order or vacuum for, for the tables. All right, um, that's all for the ecosystem. Next, some basic concepts in Zoom. So in a nutshell, what Zoom does is to translate this job specification file, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, into a Spark streaming job and submit it to the Spark cluster. When it does the translation, there are two scenarios it needs to handle. One is a pen only, the other is merge. So for a pen only scenario, what it does is to translate this file into the two table API so that it knows how to read the data from Kafka, generate a data frame, and then uh, create uh, files for those data frame and append them to the data table on S3. For the merge scenario, Soon knows how to translate this specification file into some merge query and execute this merge query in a for each batch API, for each micro batch. And as you can see, this specification file is in Holcomb format and user need to specify what is the source, uh, a Kaf what is the Kafka source. So they need to specify what is the source cluster Su needs to connect to and what is the Kafka topic Su needs to read from. User also needs to specify what is the target table and also define the schema for the target table. Right now, people still need to define the schema in the raw uh, column section, but in the future, we want to integrate with some external, metadata, uh, external schema service so that the schema can be provided by that external service and we can save the work for the user if, uh, when they onboard the table. In addition, people can also um, create derived columns based on these raw columns by using some UDFs. The UDF can be some UDF implemented by the user or a Spark building UDFs. All right, M multiple of this kind of uh, job specification file can be submitted into the same uh, Spark cluster in order to reuse this cluster reusability. How does Zoom differentiate what, what is a pen only job and what is a merge job? Well, the way how Zoom makes the judgment is based on some column called its primary key. By default, its primary key would be set to false for all columns. And then Zoom knows that this is a, a pen only job. So for a pen only job, we support different kind of event formats like uh, JSON or protobuf or any kinds of uh, customized binary format that a user can implement a deserializer and plug it into the framework. And we also support using any physical column or generated column as a partition column for your data table. We also support backfills. Backfill can be backfilling from the Kafka directly or backfilling from the S3 location, where the data files on the S3 location can be written by some Kafka connect S3 sync connectors. Okay, if any of the column or multiple, multiple columns are marked as true for this primary key, then soon knows that this is a merge job. So for merge job, we have implemented many optimizations to improve the merge performance. I will cover more about that later. And there are two scenarios for the merge. One is merge for the CDC events, the other is merge for the non-CDC events. So for the CDC events merge, the event itself needs to be in the standard CDC event schema, which I will cover uh, in the next slide. And for now, the CDC event merge, we only support JSON format. For the non-CDC event merge, it can be any format, JSON or protobuf, doesn't matter. One big difference is that uh, the deletes are not supported in the merge non-CDC scenario. Okay, the soon standard CDC event schema. The reason we, why we designed this schema is to unify all databases raw CDC schema into one. 
because we heavily rely on different kind of open source Kafka source connectors. And the, the CDC schema sent out by those open source connectors vary so much. There are many kinds of uh, schemas. And we don't want to implement one read, uh, multi many readers for, in order to read this uh, CDC events in Zoom. And we don't think that that's the right place to do it. So instead, we let the Kafka Connect to, to take this responsibility. So we leverage some feature called SMT, Simple Message Transform in Kafka Connect, to do this kind of transformation, to transform different kind of raw CDC schema into this standard schema. So this design comes with two benefits. First is, these CDC events are not only consumed by the Zoom pipeline. They are also consumed by some other applications running in Spark or your backend services. It can support other scenarios like uh, table migration, normally detection, production monitoring. So with this single, simple, and a standard CDC event, it just makes every engineer's life easier at Coinbase if you want to deal with CDC events. The second benefit is, for some reason, sometimes people don't want to onboard the Kafka source connectors. So they can directly emit the events in this schema from their backend services, and soon has no problem ingesting that, as if it's re-ingesting from the CDC events emit from the Kafka source connectors. So we end up having one fewer component to maintain in the middle. All right, so when soon does merge, it basically do two things. The first thing it does is LCS, last change selection. What this does is to figure out what is the last change for a specific key or spe uh, for a specific merge key or primary keys. The way how we do it is to do first run a window function. We first partition the micro, micro batch by these merge keys, and then we sort the changes based on the operation time field and the offsets. And then based on that, we can figure out what is the last change for, for a key. And we build a data frame for the last change for all keys, and we call that stream events. The next step is soon we'll generate a merge query to apply, to merge these stream events into the target table. And for the merge, we do three operations based on the last operation of the event type and whether this event can be matched on the target table. So if the last operation type is delete and we can find a match, then we just delete it from the target table. If the last operation is not delete and we can find a match, then we just update the entire row. Lastly, if the last operation is not delete and we don't find a match, we'll do an insert. Okay, next let's take a closer look at what the CDC uh, standard CDC event schema looks like. On the right hand side, you can see two examples. The top one is for the update event and the bottom one is for delete. So, as you can see, it has five fields. The first field is OC for operation code. So currently we support three operation code. We have I for insert, D for delete, and U for update. And next field is NS for namespace. Our, our current implementation is to create one CDC topic for one, one table. But sometimes people want to create a shared topic for multiple tables. Maybe they have many small tables in one database or those tables don't have enough traffic, so, so, so they just want to create one shared topic. Uh, for a bunch of tables. Well, in this case, then you need the NS view to help you differentiate what this change is for which table. All right, the next field is OT, operation time. This is a timestamp when this change happens uh, for your upstream database. And this is also the timestamp that we use in our LCS operation to figure out what is the last change uh, for a specific key. This is also the timestamp that it will emit to the external metadata service to report in, uh, ingestion progress, to, to report a high watermark. The next two fields are PK and VA. So the columns under PK and VA compose the row for your table. So PK is short for primary key and VA is for, short for uh, uh, value. So as the name implies, the columns on the PK are the primary, composite primary key columns for your row or the unique, unique keys for your row. And the columns on the VA are just the rest of the column for that row. The values for those columns don't need to come from an immediate post image after the change. Actually, not all Kafka source connectors can guarantee that. And from the Zoom perspective, it actually doesn't matter because Zoom is gonna do an LCS anyway to figure out what is the last change. So we can skip some intermediate versions of your change.
Okay, one last thing to mention is this VA field may not always be available. So for the delay events, we can only guarantee that the PK fields are there. All right, that's all for the basic concepts in Zoom. So next, let's take a deep dive into the optimizations we have implemented in Zoom. I personally feel very excited about this because we have put a lot of effort into optimizing the merge queries. And all of our effort can be categorized into uh, three perspectives. The first one is, how can we reduce the amount of data to load from S3 for your target table? And second perspective is, how can we reduce the amount of data to write for your target table? And the last one is, how can we reduce unnecessary shuffles or joins, whether it's possible to replace the merge query with something else? Let's take a look at them one by one. All right, the first one is min-max range optimization. This is to reduce the amount of data to load for, from S3 for your target table. The way how we do it is to add an additional filter with min and max to your merge query so that you can load less data. The range of this filter comes from your micro batch that we read data from Kafka and then we generate data frame. We, min, we run the min and max aggregation on some column for your micro batch and then we get the range. So this is the range that updates happen and this is also the range that you only need to load from S3 for your target table so that you can reduce the amount of data to load. When you apply this optimization in, uh, for the merge scenario, there, uh, there are two cases. One is for merge, CDC, for merge non-CDC, you can apply this optimization on any column that's merge key or any column that's immutable or don't contain any null values. For merge CDC scenario, you can only apply this column to the merge keys because the other columns may not be available if it's a delay event. All right, so when we apply this optimization in production, we see about 20% performance improvement for large tables. As we run this min-max range optimization for some time in production, we start to see some interesting update patterns, making us to think whether we can enhance this optimization to the next level. So um, as you can see on the, on the screen, that for some table we realize the updates can happen only to the records that are created in the most recent weeks or months. It is only a few updates in the long past that makes the min-max range really wide. So the idea is how can we get rid of the holes within this min-max range that doesn't have any updates? To do that, we, we do it through the k-min's range optimization. So basically, we still read uh, the micro, micro batch from Kafka, and we generate a data frame out of it. And then we spend about 30 seconds to run the k-means clustering algorithm on your data frame based on some column. And we group the changes into 10 small clusterings by default. And instead of doing the min-max on the wide range, we run the min-max aggregation on each one of the clustering. So we, this time, we don't create one wide filter. And instead, we create 10 small filters. And then we will apply those 10 small filters to add those 10 small filters to the merge query. So that's how we further reduce the amount of data to load from S3 for your target table to, in order to improve the merge performance. All right, when we, after we apply this optimization for some tables, um, we see another 15 to 20% performance improvement for, for those scenarios. But when you apply this optimization in production, you don't want to blindly turn on this optimization for all tables because it only makes sense to run this uh, k-means uh, clustering when your update follow, the, follow this kind of update patterns. Okay, so this k-means range optimization, right now we support uh, four data types. We can apply this optimization for integer type, long type, timestamp type, and also the Mongo ID string type. So basically for the Mongo ID string, the first few bytes of the Mongo ID are actually timestamps. That's why we can apply this optimi optimization there. All right, that's all, for, uh, that's all what I have for, to improve the, uh, to reduce the amount of data to load for, uh, for the merge query. Next is, about next is about optimization we do in order to reduce the amount of data to write for your target table. For that, we have the no update merge optimization. So we have a lot of this use case for the deduplication for merge non-CDC scenario. So when people emit events in Kafka, they will do at least once delivery. However, when they try to ingest the events into the Delta Lake, 
they don't want to see duplicated records. In order to optimize the merge query for this scenario, so you can turn on the no update merge. And, and in this case, we're only doing search if we don't find a match. As you recall previously, the merge query will do three things. It will do delete, insert, and update. And here, it will only do insert. And we can further improve the performance of this kind of merge query by combining this optimization with the min-max range optimization I mentioned previously to further reduce the amount of data to load for, from S3 so that you can get a very good merge query performance. Okay, the last optimization we have for merge is the merge with insert optimization. The idea is to use the insert query to replace the merge query by analyzing your micro batch first to see if this micro batch only contains insert events, then why, why do you run merge query? So we, we actually have a lot of this kind of use case uh, at Coinbase because a lot of our Postgres table are designed based on some Postgres table feature called partition tables. For example, you can have your orders table where you have active partition and historic partition. The active partition for your Postgres table can be small, and, but it has a lot of update traffic. On the other hand, the uh, historic partition can be much larger than the active partition, but most of the changes to the historic partition are inserts. And occasionally you will have the delete event, maybe because people close their accounts and we need to delete the historical transaction for those, for those accounts. So the way how we implement this kind of table is we implement these two partitions separately. We create a one CDC topic for each partition, and then for the active partition, we uh, replicate them using the standard, using the normal merge updates way, because the table size is small, so the performance is good. On the other hand, for the historic partition, a lot of times it's just doing insert. Occasionally, once or twice a day, you, you may process the batch delete request, so the performance is also good. And on the Delta Lake, we'll create a, a view on top to union those two partitions together. So that's how we merge this kind of table in order to get a very good uh, a table, replica, uh, table uh, replication performance. Okay, so one more slide for optimization. This is, this is to optimize the read performance. All right, for all, ta all soon tables, we have the auxiliary pipeline that automatically onboard those tables to do the uh, optimize or Z order and a vacuum. So when people onboard a table too soon, when they, when they implement their job specification file, they also need to specify what are the columns you need to use for the Z order. By default, if people don't specify that, if it's a merge scenario, we'll use the merge keys by default. And those metadata will be sent by the soon framework to the external metadata service. And then when the auxiliary pipeline runs, it will fetch those metadata from this metadata service so that it knows what tables are partition tables and what tables are non-partition tables and what are the columns that it needs to use in order to run the z-order. So, so the auxiliary pipeline will run the optimize and z-order differently for different table, and after that, it will run the vacuum. It's important to run the vacuum because if you uh, do this kind of merge operation every 30 minutes, then each time it will create a version. And uh, over, over time, it will create a lot of versions for your table, and it creates a lot of, use a lot of like, uh, data storage on S3 for your table. Well, the merge query and the, the auxiliary optimization job, both of them are doing the, same, doing the update to the same table. So we need a way to coordinate them. The way how we do it is still through the external metadata service, such that when the merge query runs, it will set the state to merge, and when it's done, it will set it back to idle. And on the other hand, when, the op, uh, when, when this opti optimized job runs, it will first check the state. If the state is merge, it will wait, wait until it becomes idle, and then it will start. When it starts, it will set the state to the order. And on the other hand, this uh, merge job will do the same, similar thing. So that's how we coordinate these two conflict jobs that updates the same table. Otherwise, the job may fail on either side randomly. Okay, that's all for optimization we have implemented in the SU framework. Last one, uh, the last, lastly, it's about um, the incremental load from the SU tables in the Delta Lake to other system. Here I'm talking about Snowflake. So this design is based on change data feed, and this methodology can be applied to any data system. 
as you can see on the screen, the change data feed is basically tra uh, tracks what kind of change you, uh, p user has done to, to, the target, uh, to the data table. It tells you what rows are inserted for at which version and what rows are deleted at which version. And what, how the, what this row looks like before the update and what this row looks like after update. So with this CDF data, we can naturally solve the problem, the hard delete pro problem, which we, we couldn't solve in our existing way of doing incremental load, which is built based on some timestamp column. So previously, we were relying on this timestamp column for the incremental load. We keep track of the high watermark that we have copied so far. And next time when the incremental load runs, we will get all the rows that's beyond this high watermark. So that's how we do the incremental load previously. But this kind of methodology cannot handle the hard deletes which now can be naturally resolved by this CDF data. So if you want to do incremental copy for the append-only scenario, that's easy because the CDF data keeps track of what changes happened between any two versions of your data table. You can sim simply figure out what the rows have been added between these two versions and copy those rows over to, your, to the other data system. The design I want to share here is how to do this incremental load for merge updates tables. In order to do this, we create two support tables. One is delete, the other is updates, upserts. For the delete table, we, we uh, figure out what rows have been, have been deleted between two versions. One version is the high watermark uh, table version in Snowflake, which we have uh, incrementally ingested, so far, copied over so far. The other version is the current version in, Snoop, uh, in Databricks. So we rely on the CDF data to figure out what rows have been deleted between these two versions, and they will create a uh, delete uh, table out of it. On the other hand, we create uh, the upsert table, which do the similar thing, but this time, we want to keep track of what rows have been upserted or inserted between these two versions. And this time, instead of relying on the high watermark for the table version, we rely on the high watermark for the operation time, which is a field in the um, soon standard CDC event schema. So we will basically look at the current version of the soon table, and we get all the rows that's larger, uh, and larger than and equal to this high watermark of the operation time minus some, look, uh, some small look back window. And those are all the rows that have been upserted or inserted between these two versions. And so we can create an upsert table out of it. And then we apply these two tables in order to the target Snowflake table. We first delete everything from, from the delete table, and then we merge everything from the upsert table to the target table. This is done in our table replication service, which is responsible for sync the two systems. One is Snowflake, one is Delta Lake. And this is also um, what do we do to achieve the business, business continuity and uh, agility while maintaining both the Snowflake and the Delta Lake at the same time? 